Hello and welcome back. Last month, I talked about my bag of expired film, and I promised that I'd be popping back in with the results as I go along shooting it. In that video, I discuss my plan going forward. We're going to start with one roll of Portra 160 NC, we're going to shoot it at 80 ISO, and we're going to bracket every exposure, and we're going to evaluate. Well, I'm back and I'm happy to report that the test roll of Portra 160 NC that I shot could not have gone any better. Rather than spoil all of the images up top, let's run through the whole process and get into everyone's favorite subject in school, math. Or maths, if you come from a part of the world that says maths. I shot the roll in my Canon FTB QL. The QL stands for Quick Load. I was rating this film at 80 ISO, as recommended by posts online saying that you should offer the film one extra stop of light if the film is expired. I also don't own a light meter, and the light meter in my FTB is busted. I replaced the battery and everything, but no luck, still couldn't get it to work. Very quickly, I want to explain the idea of rating your film at a faster ISO. ISO sensitivity is a standard set by the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. It represents the sensitivity to light that your film has as a numerical value. A higher number indicates a higher sensitivity and a greater ability to capture light. A lower number means your film is less sensitive and will, in turn, require more light to achieve quote-unquote proper exposure. A technically proper exposure is said to be one that contains detail in the shadows and the highlights of a photo, one where no information is lost. But don't focus too much on the term proper exposure. The real proper exposure is the one that you're happy with and the one that matches your vision. But back to the ISO, by rating the film at 80, we are essentially tricking the camera into allowing double the amount of light into it. You see, there's this thing called the exposure triangle. Chances are you may have heard of it. It consists of three things, the shutter speed of the camera, the aperture of the lens, and the sensitivity, or ISO, of the film. I don't want to focus on this too much because I think that it actually requires a video all on its own, but I will tell you that one of the fun things about the triangle is the fixed nature of the numbers. Let me explain with some examples. Let's say we're shooting 100 speed film at 1 60th of a second and our lens is at f8. And then let's say that we want to keep our f-stop at 8, but there's too much light hitting the film, causing an overexposure. We can't change the ISO of the film, so our only option is to adjust our shutter speed. Adjusting the shutter speed in this direction, speeding it up, will be decreasing the amount of time that the shutter is open, and thereby decreasing the light input by half as much with each adjustment. Whereas going the other direction, slowing it down, you will be doubling the amount of time the shutter is open and doubling the amount of light hitting the film. So we want to speed up the shutter and allow less light to hit the film. If we go two adjustments to the right, we now have proper exposure. But let's say the f-stop doesn't matter. We could leave everything where it was and move the f-stop two stops to the right and achieve proper exposure. If we're shooting on a digital camera, we could leave everything where it was and adjust our ISO two adjustments to the right and achieve the same exposure. Of course, the properties of the images in each scenario we just talked about will be different, but we're not talking about that here, we're just talking about exposure. The point is that if we look at the chart, I was treating this film as though it were 80 ISO and not 160. Since the light meter in my Canon FTB doesn't work, I was using a digital camera to check my exposures, but my digital camera's ISO range doesn't go below 160 ISO. So that means I had to do a little bit of math. If proper exposure was 160 ISO at f5.6 and 1 60th of a second, I could change the f-stop to f4, and that would effectively be the same as if I had adjusted the ISO to 80, because I'm adding an additional one stop of light. It's a little confusing because it sounds like I should be interpreting it the other way, that I'm making the film more sensitive, therefore I should be rating the film at 200 or even 320. But with film, the ISO is baked in. I can't change that. I can only change how the camera or the light meter or the settings of my camera interpret it. So by adjusting my aperture and opening it up a full stop, I'm effectively treating the film as if it requires more light than it actually does therefore overexposing it intentionally. From there, I get my range to bracket from. I shoot at the normal exposure and then go an extra extra stop over and one stop under, which would effectively just be treating the film as though I'm shooting it at box speed. What I found across the board was that I actually preferred the exposures that were one stop over 80 ISO, or to put it another way, two stops over from box speed, which was 160. 
I think now is a good time to transition and go look at some photos. Up first, we have a photo of this hotel sign on the side of this building here in Brooklyn. Here, I was shooting at 1 60th of a second across the board, and from left to right, we have f5.6, f8, and f11. I do think a cloud rolled through at some point because the f8 and f11 shots look pretty similar, but the main takeaway is that this film held up really well, even better than I was anticipating. The dynamic range is impressive. I don't have any loss in the highlights or the shadows. And the color rendition is mwah, fabulous. Overall, I love the colors and the sharpness of the film itself. We are off to a great start. Just for fun, just for and giggles, let's compare this to the same photo that I took on Harmon Phoenix 200. Now, I'm not making a statement about Harmon Phoenix. This is just a little fun comparison between an expired film and this brand new one, showing how the expired stuff really has held up nicely. Up next, we have the Pepsi Cola sign. Here, oddly enough, we don't see much of a difference between all of these shots. I shot this at 1 30th of a second because I wanted to retain f8 as our target f-stop. When I metered at 160 ISO, we wanted to be at 1 60th of a second, so I allowed double the amount of light into the camera using the shutter speed rather than the aperture. From left to right, we have f5.6, f8, and f11, and frankly, any of these are passable. These are also unedited, by the way, I should mention that. Up next, we have some binoculars on the boardwalk. Here we can see some slight color shifting, and also we really see that depth of field getting larger as we go. When I metered this at 160 ISO, I got f4 at 1 125th of a second. I knew that I wanted to keep f4 as our target, so I adjusted the shutter to 1 60th, and so from left to right we have f2.8, f4, and f5.6. This is pretty much the theme from here on out. Any of these would work for me. I prefer the 2.8 version primarily because of that shallow depth of field, but honestly, all of these are great and workable. Up next is a bottle of Presidente between some rocks. Here, the only major differences I see are the depth of field again. This was shot at 1 30th of a second at f2.8, f4, and f5.6 respectively. Comparing the 2.8 and the 5.6, we can really see the subtle differences in the focus and also some slight color shifting. Again, these are scans from the lab with no adjustments from myself. The saturation and contrast is also different, but that could be the scans. I don't know. I haven't seen the negatives yet. I'm going to speed this up a little bit because we're really seeing the same things across the board. Here we have a taxi and here are the settings that I shot it at. We see that color shift again at the stop down end of the spectrum, which remember would be the equivalent of me shooting this at box speed, which is 160 ISO. Here is the boathouse at Prospect Park, and here are the specs for all of those. Again, really great that I can confidently shoot this film realistically a couple stops underexposed and still come away with some great tonality and dynamic range. I have plenty of information in the shadows if I need to bump that a little bit. Here's a photo of an Abraham Lincoln statue. We can see the color of the sky changing slightly as we move along, and Abe gets darker a bit as well. Not much else to comment on here. Here's a lamppost. Same thing as Honest Abe. The blue of the sky comes back when we stop down and our depth of field gets deeper, but all of these are usable. Okay, for this last one, I screwed up a bit, and my camera had a malfunction after this last photo. I accidentally took the first photo without checking the f-stop. So I took this one at f4 instead of f5.6. So technically the first one is two stops over what I was looking for. And oh, it's a bit of a happy accident because I could see that even two stops overexposed, which to reiterate is three stops over box speed. I've barely begun to lose any information in the highlights. And I don't, I don't know, that's just fantastic that a film that hasn't been touched in who knows how long, is still able to produce such great results. So wrapping this whole thing up, I don't know about you, but I'm very excited to shoot the remaining six rolls of Portra 160 NC that I have in the bag. But that being said, it's going to take me a while to do so, so don't expect that video for a little while. I don't want to rush it, and I also don't want to shoot the same old stuff on every roll. I might try some portraits on one roll and landscapes in another, and I also want to try shooting a roll in each of my cameras just to see how the results vary. In a broader sense, what I discovered was that the film appears to be in pretty good shape. Unless by some miracle I grabbed the only roll in the bag that was well-maintained and the rest are complete duds, I should be able to expect similar results from everything else in the bag. 
My plan next is a bit of a mystery as of this recording. The holidays are right around the corner, and I have little time to really go out and shoot. And also, when it comes to this bag, I want to be a bit more deliberate with what I'm shooting. I want there to be a bit more purpose with each role in this bag, whether that means I pick one specifically, like the uh, Ektachrome E200, to shoot a portrait session with. I think, I think I might do that. Essentially, what I want to avoid is taking a roll, putting it in a camera, and leaving it there for a month or something like that, because uh, otherwise I just end up shooting this and that, and then uh, these, these results may get all tangled up if I start doing that. I would much rather load the film and shoot it right away. And that, I think, brings us to the conclusion of part two of this saga of the bag of expired film. I still don't have a catchy name for it, so if you've got any ideas, let me know in the comments. I hope this was enjoyable and informative for all of you out there. Uh, follow along the journey by hitting the subscribe button, hit the bell to be notified when new videos are released. Uh, go ahead and hit that like button. You can find the join button, become a member, get some interesting perks. Uh, you could also head over to my print shop, and for a few bucks, you can buy a print of mine and help this channel grow that way. Anyway, I'm going to leave you off with the photos from this test roll of Portra 160NC, and I'll see you all next time.